I'd now like to talk about how we can store that effort used to stretch a spring or compress a spring or a, a flex an elastic material. Uh, the amount of energy that's required to do so, which is stored, I would like to quantify that. So let's just think about let's think about a simple situation, just one of our uh, red or our green springs stretching it from its relaxed state. Let's say call this a position of zero. And what things determine how much effort is involved to stretch that spring, consequently the amount of effort or energy stored in that spring? Well, one is obviously how far this, this spring is stretched. If you stretch it farther, it's going to require more effort and it will store more of that effort. So the energy required to stretch a spring involves the combination of, number one, the displacement or stretch of that spring. If you think back to our red and our green spring, our red spring was our weakest spring that we tested, the green one was the strongest one. Uh, it would require different amounts of force uh, to stretch each of these things the same amount. And so it not only depends on the amount of stretch of the spring, it also depends on the force you use to stretch that spring. If you need more force to stretch it and you stretch it farther, both of those things will increase the amount of effort involved and therefore the amount of energy stored. So if we want to represent this quantitatively, uh, we need to somehow represent the combination of this force and stretch together. So it kind of leaves us to the question, well, how do we represent the combination of any two values in general? I'd like to go back and talk about how we found displacement of a moving object, because that also involved the combination of two different things. Uh, if you're moving, your displacement depends on two things. Number one, how fast you're traveling, and how much time you're traveling at that speed. If you're moving faster, you're going to go farther. If you're moving uh, at the same speed and you're traveling for a longer amount of time, you'll also go farther. So your displacement depends on both. So let's go back and think about how did we represent displacement. Let's think about it graphically. Um, under constant velocity, if something was moving at a, a, vel a constant velocity of 2 meters per second, say for a total of 6 seconds, we found this graphically by finding the area under the line, specifically in a velocity versus time graph. So if we shade in that area right there, remember that the displacement is, in this case, the area of a, tr of a rectangle. So we have height times width. Our height is 2 meters per second. Our width of our rectangle is 6 seconds. So the displacement is 12 meters. See that the second units cancel. Well, this worked not only when our velocity was constant, we could also use that same technique to find out the displacement of an object that's accelerating. Let's say something moves from an initial velocity of 0 meters per second to a final velocity of 3 meters per second over a total of 6 seconds. We can also find that displacement by finding the area under this line. In this case, it's a triangle and not a rectangle. We have 1 half times the base of our triangle times the height, and that gives us a displacement of 9 meters. So remember, we were trying to find a way to quantitatively represent the combination of two values. In the case of displacement, it depended on how fast you're traveling, the velocity, and how much time you're traveling, that speed or time. So if we graph one variable versus the other variable, or velocity versus time, the area underneath the line or whatever get, that gets plotted happens to be the combination of both of those things both velocity and time. Let's now use this idea to quantitatively determine the amount of energy stored in a spring. Remember we said the amount of effort involved or the effort or energy stored is related to two things, both the force used or the force exerted by the spring uh, over some displacement and that the energy or effort depended on both. And so if we want to represent quantitatively the combination of the force used over some amount of stretch, we're going to graph force versus stretch and the area under whatever is plotted represents the combination of both of those values. So let's do this one for our red spring and two for the green spring. If you remember our red spring when we graphed force versus stretch 
Uh, it had a slope of about 25 newtons per meter. That means it takes about 25 newtons of force in the end to stretch it to a total distance of one meter. Stretch it to half a meter, it only takes half of that, or about 12.5 newtons. So the energy to stretch the spring, which is also equal to the energy stored in the spring, is equal to the area under a force versus stretch graph. If we shade in that area, since this is a linear, positive linear relationship, we have the area of a triangle. So the energy stored is equal to the area of a triangle, which is one half base times height. And we'll call this uh, elastic energy, or the energy stored in an elastic material. It's equal to one half times the base. Well, the base is one meter times the height, which is a uh, force of 25 newtons. And you get 12.5 newton meters, or newton times meters. So we'd say that the elastic energy is equal to 12 and a half newton meters, or joules. Uh, in physics, we use the joule to represent the combination of a newton times a meter. Uh, and this is our metric measure of energy. Let's now do the same thing for the green spring. Uh, that green spring, remember, it was stronger or stiffer. It required more force per meter to stretch it. And so we'd imagine if we stretch the green spring one meter, it's going to store more effort or more energy. We can see that by the triangle now shaded under that green line on a force versus stretch graph. And if we calculate or quantify that energy, again, this is the area of a triangle, one half base times height. Uh, we get one half times the base of one meter times the height, in this case, is 50 newtons. We see that the amount of effort or energy stored is 25 newton meters, or 25 joules. Let's look at the green spring a little bit closer. We just, just calculated that it stores 25 newton meters, or 25 joules of energy requires that much to stretch it a meter and it stores that amount of effort. Let's look at what happens uh, over the first half meter of that stretch and then over the second half meter of that stretch. So if we stretch the spring from its relaxed state an additional half of a meter or 50 centimeters and this is the general force versus stretch graph for how force is related to stretch for the green spring. For the first half meter of stretch we've got the air, the energy stored uh, is represented by the area. It's 6.25 newton meters or six and a quarter joules. If we then go from that half a meter stretch to the remaining full meter of stretch, so an additional half a meter, we're stretching it, stretching it from a half meter to one meter, the energy stored or the effort required to stretch at the last half meter is an additional 6.25 and 12.5 newton meters or joules. That's the total area under the last half of that force versus stretch graph. And that's a combination of 18.75 joules. So we can see that the first half meter, it stores six and a quarter joules of energy. For the last half meter, that spring stores three times that amount of energy for a total of 25 joules. Now think about why would that make sense that the first half meter there's only six and a quarter joules stored, where the last half meter stretch there's 18.75 joules of energy. It's because the spring at a half meter to one meter requires a much larger force the entire half meter of stretch. Remember, the energy stored is related to the force used over some displacement. Since the force is larger over that half meter of displacement, there will be a larger amount of energy stored.